All right. So please welcome Professor Stanley Temple. Thank you, Terry. And um, some of you may know about my reputation as a wildlife conservationist and conservation biologist. I am not a historian. However, this presentation grew out of a lecture that I gave for many years to a course in conservation biology at the University of Wisconsin. And I was really quite um, surprised that students who were actually majoring in conservation fields knew so little about the history of conservation philosophy in the United States and in North America. So this presentation will take you through a couple of hundred years of the evolution of the American conservation philosophy. And I can sort of start with European settlement and the approach that the colonists had to North America was one of, of wonderment coming from Europe that was so heavily developed. Uh, they came to the mistaken impression that they were entering this vast word wilderness, a virgin wilderness, if you will. They had sort of overlooked the fact that North America had been very fully occupied and very extensively transformed by indigenous peoples. But this idea that North America was a vast untouched wilderness led to this sort of misguided philosophy that the natural resources of the continent were essentially super abundant compared to anything they'd experienced in Europe and probably inexhaustible. And that attitude, that philosophy prevailed until really the mid 19th century. And the mid 19th century was really a, a wake up call for Americans. It was a time when the depletion of important natural resources uh, could no longer be denied. Uh, forests were being uh, cleared. Uh, the slaughter of bison and passenger pigeons uh, was hard to ignore. The landscape was essentially being changed. And the frontier mentality gradually came to an end when people started to realize that there were limits to North America's natural resources. So the real dawning of an American conservation philosophy, at least during and after European settlement, uh, began essentially in the mid 19th century. And one individual stands out as being essentially the person who introduced this philosophy. George Perkins Marsh um, first articulated a really American conservation philosophy in his book, Man and Nature, or the Earth as Modified by Human Action. This was a remarkably prescient view of how human beings were affecting soil and, and water and even the climate. It was um, the dawning essentially of, of a realization that human beings were having a dramatic impact on North America. His philosophy of conservation um, was not fully mature, you might say, in that it was still sort of based on a Judeo-Christian stewardship ethic, uh, that man was sort of responsible, human beings were responsible for taking care um, of, of the earth. George Perkins Marsh has largely, I think, been forgotten. It certainly was by my students in conservation biology, and many people don't realize his important seminal uh, contributions. But he gave rise to essentially an American consciousness, whoops, an American consciousness uh, that became sort of widely known um, through the, the efforts of Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. They were, of course, well-known figures, writers, um, at the time in the mid in the mid 19th century, and both became quite interested in in conservation and especially in in wilderness. So they were quite concerned about American sort of lack of appreciation of nature and especially of the aesthetic and sort of spiritual values of nature, and they promoted very actively in their in their writing and speaking a sort of a getting Americans sort of reconnected with with wild nature. By the mid 19th century, of course, most people were uh, sort of moving into towns, towns, cities were growing, and people were sort of losing contact with the natural natural world. Uh, 
So their approach was, as it said here in the quote, to invigorate and strengthen the body, inspire the imagination, energize the mind, elevate the soul, and provide an occasion for transcending finite human consciousness. That was clearly the Romantic era's way of saying, you know, get back in touch with, with nature. So at the time, um, probably wilderness was disappearing more rapidly than any other time in American history. And these two individuals through their writing and advocacy uh, really inspired what we might call the first real well-formulated American conservation philosophy. And that was the idea of wilderness preservation. These two individuals, Thoreau probably more than anyone else was this prominent advocate for preserving wilderness. And uh, he wrote about it in, in many different ways, but this quote, I think that each town should have a park or rather a primitive forest of 500 or a thousand acres where a stick should never be cut, nor for the Navy, nor for making to make wag wagons, but to stand and decay for higher uses, common possession forever for instruction and recreation. So they were advocating essentially for leaving parts of the American landscape intact, essentially what today we would call wilderness, and their philosophy was to preserve uh, these areas. And it was a somewhat, well, they were a part of the romantic period, so not surprisingly, they were romanticizing wilderness. Ralph Waldo Emerson was probably the person who did this the most. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, of course, a very prominent intellectual in, in, in New England, uh, in 1858, he formed what he called the Philosopher's Club. And the Philosopher's Club was an interesting collection of the leading intellectuals uh, of the time that would go on wilderness camping trips in the Adirondacks. And the painting uh, below uh, by William James Stillman uh, illustrates their, their sort of getting back in touch with nature, leaving Boston and New York and Philadelphia and essentially heading into the Adirondacks, which was at the time uh, was largely a wilderness area. And Ralph Waldo Emerson's writing about uh, the Adirondacks in his poem, The Adirondacks, said, do not go where the path may lead, go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. It's this sort of uh, modern idea of, you know, go into a wilderness area and leave nothing but your footprints. But between Thoreau and Emerson, they really did a lot to sort of further an appreciation of the fact that wilderness was disappearing and that it needed to be preserved. But probably the person who popularized it to the sort of common person uh, was William Henry Harrison Murray. He was a very prominent newspaper man and, and sort of popular author. Thoreau and Emerson, you know, appealed to the, the more intellectually elite class, but uh, Murray's approach was to uh, write things that were accessible to the common person. And his 1869 book on adventures in the wilderness or camp life in the Adirondacks was for the time a bestseller. It literally sold thousands of copies and it led in its wake to a stampede on the Adirondacks. Um, it led to literally thousands and thousands of people deciding because of the wonderful descriptions in, in Murray's book to go and visit the Adirondacks. And the Adirondacks became essentially uh, New England's uh, wilderness. It was a place where people went to get back in touch uh, with nature. And that led in 1892 to the formation of the Adirondack Forest Preserve, which was really one of the first wilderness preserves in the nation, a place that was preserved primarily for its wilderness characteristics, not necessarily for its great scenic beauty or geological formations, but simply because it was a wild place. And the uh, motto of the Adirondack Forest Preserve, forever wild. So this was really the first time that Americans preserved a place because of its wilderness of values. But of course, several years earlier in 1872, 
we created the first national park in the world at Yellowstone, Yellowstone National Park, uh, created by Ulysses S. Grant's administration was created for a somewhat different purpose. It wasn't intended to preserve wilderness. As the description says, it was a public park or pleasuring ground for the enjoyment of, of the people. It was a place to go and marvel essentially at the geology of, of, of Yellowstone. And Yellowstone really became popularized again uh, by someone who sort of gave it this cachet of, of a wonderland. Um, and that was, uh, that was Thomas, as he was often called, Thomas Yellowstone Moran. He accompanied one of the first expeditions to explore the Yellowstone ecosystem and came back with these wonderful paintings of the landscape that as much as anything else uh, was responsible for convincing people that we really should preserve this sort of geological wonderland uh, of Yellowstone. But it's important to note that the creation of national parks was not first and foremost an effort to preserve wilderness. It was to preserve places that had essentially scenic beauty and that would be popular with tourists. And it quickly, of course, became uh, a destination for the expanding railroads and accommodations for all the tourists that, that came to these national parks. Very different from the type of wilderness experience uh, that the mid 19th century uh, New Englanders thought about with the Adirondacks. Toward the end of the 19th century, the person that probably more than any other gets associated with the, the wilderness preservation movement was John Muir. John Muir, a, a adventurer, a, a very prolific writer and speaker, uh, probably did more than anyone else to popularize this idea that had been growing for several decades of, of wilderness preservation. And wilderness preservation really was, as I said, the, the sort of first conservation philosophy that we had here in the country. Uh, for Muir, wilderness preservation was uh, essentially an extension of the philosophy that had been introduced by Emerson and Thoreau. And um, what, again, what, what Muir did was to sort of write about his travels in wilderness areas. And he wrote about it in, in such compelling terms that people couldn't help but be sort of enamored of the, the beauty um, and the spiritual values of experiencing these remote wilderness areas. And as a result, John Muir uh, has sort of become thought of by many as the father of the national parks, which of course he, he wasn't really. Uh, the national park system got expansion because of Muir, but uh, had not really been created by him. But he certainly was the founder of the Sierra Club and is often thought of as being the, the sort of leading figure or patron saint of the wilderness preservation movement, which as a philosophy, we can kind of uh, call it the preservationism of, of philosophy. So moving on in the early 20th century, a very different philosophy emerged and it was championed by Gifford Pinchot. Gifford Pinchot was a prominent forester at the time. He was uh, responsible for establishing the Society of American Foresters. His wealthy Eastern family endowed the Yale School of Forestry, the first real program at a university in the United States that was devoted to conservation. And as a result of his prominence in forestry, um, he was appointed by Teddy Roosevelt as the first chief of the brand new US Forest Service that was created in 1905. So Gifford Princhot was a very prominent conservation thinker of his time. And he introduced and articulated a very different philosophy of conservation that was firmly grounded in utilitarian values. And we can sort of think of his philosophy as a resource conservation philosophy. This resource conservation philosophy, as he described it, was to use the natural resources of the country for the greatest good, for the greatest number, for the longest time. And to him, 
conservation essentially meant the efficient exploitation of natural resources and the fair distribution of the benefits from exploiting natural resources. And at the time, of course, the modern sort of science of ecology was uh, starting to, to sort of form and Gifford Pinchot was very enamored of the use of science to inform essentially this efficient use of natural resources. So for Pinchot, he basically reduced nature to natural resources. And some of the quotes from him, I think illustrate this very clearly. There are two things on this material earth, people and natural resources. And he equated conservation with this wise use of natural resources. And again, a quote from him, the first great fact about conservation is that it stands for development. He vehemently disagreed with the notion of preserving wilderness and sort of demonized the preservationist uh, movement as aiming to lock up the resources in national parks and other protected areas. His vision, of course, for the national forests was that they were to be places where the resources of those forests could be extracted and exploited in what today we would say a sustainable way. So here we had two very prominent individuals, contemporaries, John Muir and Gifford Pinchot. And they couldn't have been more different in their philosophies of conservation. And it led to a, a falling out of, of their relationship. And, and this rift between John Muir and Gifford Pinchot was really symbolic of this schism that was dividing the nascent American conservation movement into these two somewhat hostile camps at the beginning of the 20th century. Pinchot, for his group, sort of commandeered the term conservationist as a, a sort of a counterpoint to John Muir and his followers who became known as preservationists. So this tension between conservation and preservation was the first real tension um, within the American conservation uh, movement. And both of these individuals, of course, were well connected. Here are photographs of each of them, John Muir on the left and Gifford Pinchot on the right, uh, interacting with Teddy Roosevelt, the, the first environmental president. And Teddy Roosevelt, to his credit, you know, had sympathies with both of these individuals. He was obviously enamored of, of wilderness, but he also liked Gifford Pinchot's idea of wise use and, and conservation. So Gifford Pinchot's philosophy has continued to dominate certain types of conservation uh, institutions. So his philosophy for, for many, many, for almost a century, uh, dominated the US Forest Service and the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the Bureau of Land Management. And of course, virtually every state having a Department of Natural Resources. These were all agencies, government, entities that were devoted essentially to Pinchot's philosophy of sustainable or wise use of natural resources. John Muir's philosophy, the preservationist philosophy prevailed also in some places like the National Park Service and certainly many non-governmental conservation organizations, especially the Sierra Club, which he helped found, uh, the Wilderness Society coming in 1935 and the Nature Conservancy in mid 20th century. So for a long time, these two camps uh, sort of existed side by side with a certain amount of, of tension uh, between them. There were some sort of catastrophic wake up calls in the early 20th century that were uh, <clears throat> really sort of a shock to the American consciousness, especially perhaps the extinction of the passenger pigeon in the wild in 1902, followed by its extinction in captivity uh, in 1914. But here it was the world's most abundant bird, a bird that everyone in the Eastern half of North America knew well because they dined on them. Market hunting uh, had provided pigeons to the market to be uh, consumed by people in the growing urban centers. 
And the market hunting was completely unregulated. There was no effective uh, protection for wildlife at the time. And as a result, in the span of really half a century, we managed to wipe out the most abundant bird um, in the world. And there's no question that the passenger pigeon's extinction was a turning point, and it really inspired the next sort of conservation philosophy, if you will, and that was the era of wildlife protection and the protectionist movement that we needed to protect wildlife and other natural resources from over-exploitation uh, by human beings. And the principal spokesperson for this, again, a well-known figure who wrote and, and spoke prolifically was William Temple Hornaday. He was the first director of the New York Zoological Society and was a, a real strong advocate for wildlife protection and sort of gave rise to the protectionist uh, philosophy. The protectionist philosophy was basically the idea that everything that was bad in nature was the result of human beings activities and therefore we needed to protect things in nature uh, from direct human harm. And his advocacy is basically responsible for the fact that we have American bison today. The New York Zoological Society under his direction uh, basically saved uh, a very small remnant population of American bisons and prevented uh, their extinction as one of his sort of crowning accomplishments as a protectionist to protect such a, a sort of a notable North American uh, species. His 1903 book, really a bestseller at the time, was called Our Vanishing Wildlife. And he basically railed against overhunting and commercial exploitation. A quote here, birds and mammals are now literally dying for your help. It's time for the people who don't shoot to call a halt on those who do. And if this be treason, then let my enemies make the most of it. So protectionism, this idea of protecting things from direct killing and direct harm by people ended up being the guiding philosophy for organizations that had their beginnings of the early 20th century, uh, such as perhaps most notably the National Audubon Society. So we now have a third player on the scene. We've got preservation, we've got conservation, and we've got protection. And protectionism started to take hold and have an impact. The early years of the 20th century brought a number of policy and legislative initiatives that were clearly reflection of the protectionist uh, movement. The first being the Lacey Act. The Lacey Act with John Lacey of Iowa's attempt to try to uh, make it impossible for market hunters to, uh, to sell their, their wares. And when he introduced his bill that became the Lacey Act in Congress, here's what he had to say. The wild pigeon, that's the passenger pigeon, formerly in flocks of millions has entirely disappeared from the face of the earth. We have given an awful exhibition of slaughter and destruction, which may serve as a warning to all mankind. Let us now give an example of wise conservation of what remains of the gifts of nature. So the Lacey Act was our first piece of federal conservation legislation. Teddy Roosevelt followed up with the creation of what today we call the National Wildlife Refuge System with designating a Pelican Island as a refuge. And of course, most notably in 1918, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which uh, protected migratory birds. But it was all based on protection. It was essentially protecting wildlife, protecting things from direct harm uh, by human beings. So I'm now gonna turn attention to a person, an individual whose life and career largely spanned all of these dynamic changes that were happening in the American conservation movement. And that is Aldo Leopold. Aldo Leopold, of course, quite well known here in the Midwest since he was a Midwesterner by birth, the author of a Sand County Almanac. And in the foreword to a Sand County Almanac, uh, Leopold said, I do not imply that this philosophy of land was always clear to me. It's rather the end result of a life journey in the course of which I felt sorrow, anger, puzzlement, and confusion over the inability of conservation to halt the juggernaut of land abuse. <laughs> 
Leopold was undoubtedly the premier conservation thinker of the 20th century. As I said, his life and career spanned the previous philosophies of, of preservation and conservation and protection. He was part of those movements, but he saw the weaknesses of each and through his life managed to essentially introduce what became um, several new approaches to conservation. So the life journey that Leopold talks about starts with growing up in, in Iowa, in the, in the Midwest. He was an outdoorsy kid interested in natural history studies and hunting and fishing. He pursued a career in forestry, went to Yale University and got his degree thanks to Gifford Pinchot. But he was really most interested in wildlife conservation. But he began his career, as did anyone who graduated from the Yale School, School of Forestry, uh, working on the newly created National Forest in Leopold's case in the Southwest. But in mid-career, after returning to the Midwest, he becomes interested in privately owned rural lands. And he makes the switch from working for a government agency to joining the faculty at the University of Wisconsin. And eventually, that end result of his life journey was what Leopold called our relationship with land. He used the word land essentially the way today we might talk about the ecosystem. And the end result for him was what he called a land ethic, an ethical basis for our interactions with the natural world. And the idea of land health, that the objective of living a land, el a land ethic was that the land, the ecosystems that we occupy would be healthy and we would be living in harmony uh, with nature. So I'm gonna spend a fair amount of time on Leopold here, not only because uh, I, I held the position that the university created for him at the University of Wisconsin, but because he is such a central figure in the American conservation story. Hmm. So he starts out at the Yale School of Forestry He's in the front row here, sort of stands out again by his choice of uh, fashion statement here. Uh, but like all of these individuals, Gifford Pinchot endowed the Yale School of Forestry essentially to provide a pool of professionally trained foresters that could populate the newly created national forest. And for Leopold, he got his diploma in one hand and his uh, contract with the Forest Service in the other and was shipped off to the Arizona and New Mexico territories uh, where for this kid from the upper Midwest, for the first time, he was really exposed to, to big wilderness. And for a 22 year old Aldo Leopold to suddenly be single-handedly responsible for the care of millions of acres of newly created uh, government controlled wilderness was a huge task and a very steep learning curve. And Leopold was, even at the time, rather torn between conservation and preservation. On the one hand, Gifford Pinchot was his boss. So essentially the philosophy of the agency he worked for was this idea of sustainable exploitation of natural resources. Here's another quote from Gifford Pinchot. The earth and its resources belong of right to its people. Conservation means the wise use of the earth and its resources for the lasting good of men. But Leopold also had strong allegiance to the preservationist movement. And again, contrasting Pinchot and Muir, here's Muir's statement. No dogma taught by the present civilization seems to form so insuperable an obstacle in the way of a right understanding of the relations between culture and wilderness as that which declares that the world was made especially for the uses of men. So you can see how a young Aldo Leopold with, with essentially sympathies for both of these approaches was really caught in sort of an awkward circumstance that he was responsible for making management decisions that were going to affect literally millions of acres of publicly owned uh, wildlands. And in an early sort of demonstration of Leopold's brilliance and his ability to uh, really see his way through conflicts like 
that between conservation and preservation, um, he found common ground. And he was responsible for designating the first federal wilderness area in the US, the Gila Wilderness in Arizona. And for Leopold, finding a, a common ground between these two conflicting philosophies uh, was something that he worked hard at. And I, I always marvel, Leopold, of course, known not only for his work on conservation, but for his skillful writing, he was able to defuse the Pinchot-Muir conflict in four words. Wilderness is a resource. The opening lines of an essay that he wrote in 1925 on wilderness as a form of land use. And he says that wilderness not is a resource, not only in the sense of the raw materials it contains, but also in the sense of the distinctive environment, which may, if rightly used, yield certain social values. So there he is in essentially one sentence, but really in four words, defusing this, this competition between preservation and conservation philosophies. So although Aldo Leopold created the first wilderness area on federal lands, uh, it took another 40 years before we finally institutionalized this um, in 1964 uh, with the passage of the Wilderness Act. And it's a perfect demonstration of the fact that as a conservation thinker, um, Leopold was almost always way ahead of his time. He was way ahead of his contemporaries. And because of that, he was an important figure in often uh, shifting paradigms, shifting these conservation philosophies, that he was one of the, the first and a very successful communicator who could basically promote new ways of, of thinking. And um, the, the formation of the Wilderness Act, which Aldo Leopold, of course, never lived to see, uh, said that a wilderness in contrast with those areas where man and his own work dominate, the landscape is hereby recognized as an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man is a visitor who does not remain. Essentially, you know, very much adopting uh, the, um, the preservationist uh, philosophy for protecting wilderness that had, of course, been sort of launched a full century early by those mid earlier by the mid 19th century uh, conservation philosophers. But Leopold, as I said, was often ahead of his time. And after he left the Forest Service in 1924, um, in no small part because he had a rather strong disagreement with this philosophy of using the national forest as a source of natural resources. He at the time was strongly advocating for what today we might call an ecosystem management approach. And he was frustrated that the Forest Service was not moving in that direction. So he quit in 1924 and turned his attention to his real passion which was wildlife conservation. At the time, we weren't using the word wildlife, the term was game. And Leopold became a leading thinker, the 1920s and 1930s in the wildlife conservation movement. And in one particular uh, instance, he was actually the principal architect, in fact, the, the author of the first policy statement on wildlife conservation. And when he wrote an essay in 1930 describing this new uh, policy, um, he had this to say. And it's, it's really revealing that he was uh, setting the stage for what we might call a paradigm shift. So he said, conservation is at this moment in a particularly difficult stage of its development. The set of ideas which serve to string out the remnants of the virgin game supply, that would be preservationism and protectionism, and to which many of us feel an intense personal loyalty seem to have reached the limits of their effectiveness. Something new must be done. And for Leopold, that was a new paradigm, something that would largely fill in the shortcomings of preservation and, and protection, which even by this time had started to show uh, their, their weaknesses. It simply wasn't possible 
to preserve enough wilderness areas to provide habitat for North American wildlife. And all of the protection from direct killing that one could uh, manage to enforce wasn't much use in the face of, of habitat loss. So Leopold in 1933 introduced to the new world uh, a, a new paradigm really, and that was uh, a management paradigm. And he introduced it in this book, Game Management. And game management, uh, well, in the opening, he says wildlife to be successfully conserved must be positively managed rather than merely negatively protected. So he's putting it in contrast to the protectionist movement and said, you know, we really have to manage and manage the environment if we're going to provide habitat for wildlife and have healthy populations of, of wildlife. It's not enough to protect them. We have to manage the environment in a way that promotes healthy wildlife populations. And Leopold, as I said, one of these individuals that was just constantly evolving and evolving very quickly in his thinking about conservation. So here he is in 1933, he's just written a book that introduced to the world this new idea of wildlife management that turned the entire wildlife conservation profession on, on its head. Uh, prior to Leopold's book, if you were employed in wildlife conservation, you were almost certainly a game warden. You were there to protect wildlife. And after Leopold published his book, this new profession of wildlife management uh, became the dominant aspect of the profession. But here's Leopold now, just one year later after he's introduced this management paradigm in which he's starting to think about an entirely new paradigm. So he says in this essay, conservation in whole or in part, we have seen the emergence of two kinds of conservation and two systems of thought on the subject. One kind feels a primary interest in some one aspect of land, such as soil, forest, game, or fish, with an incidental interest in the land as a whole. The other feels a primary interest in the land as a whole with incidental interest in its component resources. These two approaches lead to quite different conclusions as to what constitutes appropriate land use and how such use is to be achieved. This is now Aldo Leopold moving on and starting to think more like an ecologist, starting to think more holistically about land, starting to think about the ecosystem, thinking about all the interconnectedness that goes on and how it's just impossible to achieve conservation piecemeal uh, by just paying attention to individual natural resources. So this is a major turning point. Leopold spends the rest of his life essentially now exploring this idea of a more holistic view of nature and how we live in nature. And this is a wonderful, a wonderful essay that he uh, wrote after giving a, a lecture to the College of Engineering at the University of Wisconsin. He said, we end, I think, at what may, may, might be called the standard paradox of the 20th century. Our tools are better than we are and grow better faster than we do. They suffice to crack the atom to command the tides, but they do not suffice for the oldest task in human history to live on a piece of land without spoiling it. So Leopold is headed now in a new direction, which was way ahead of his contemporaries and was actually the first sort of premonitions of something that was going to take another 20 to 30 years to finally take form and take hold with the modern environmental movement thinking more holistically about the entire environment, not about its individual pieces. And it really, 20 years after Leopold's death, uh, it finally sort of dawned on the rest of America that we really needed to be moving in a different conservation direction than the old schools of protectionism and preservation and, and resource management. 
moving in the direction of what today we call environmentalism. And certainly individuals like Rachel Carson with her 1962 bestseller, Silent Spring, or Gaylord Nelson with 1969 Earth Day were individuals who were very prominent in sort of introducing, you might say, to the general public, something that Leopold had been talking about 20, 30 years earlier. And both Rachel Carson and Gaylord Nelson freely acknowledged that, uh, that Aldo Leopold had, had largely been the initiators of, of these new ways of thinking about conservation. And just in the same way that the changing of paradigms led to a lot of policy actions, of course, in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, a lot of things happened. The 1970s were often called the environmental decade because so many important policies and legislation was passed. The Environmental Protection Agency, NEPA, Clean Air, Clean Water, the Endangered Species, and on and on it goes. All of these new policies that were not directed toward preservation or protection or even natural resource management, but they were directed toward this holistic attention to the environment. So for Leopold, you know, this new philosophy um, was, was really quite important because it, it represented a sort of a win-win. It brought all of these sort of competing philosophies together under this overarching and more integrated and holistic view um, of nature. <clears throat> And um, Leopold, of course, recognized that he was thinking about something very new. He says here that the impulse to save wild remnants is always, I think, the forerunner of the more important and complex task of mixing a degree of wildness and utility. That idea, as Leopold said, of living in symbiosis with the land, of having a of sort of a positive relationship with the land rather than a, a negative relationship. A positive exercise, as he said, of skill and insights, not merely a negative exercise in abstinence or caution. And finally, he really defined this new idea that today we call environmentalism as living in a state of harmony between men um, and land. And the way Leopold imagined this was going to happen was through the gradual evolution of what he called a land ethic. This idea that was taken from what is common knowledge in human communities. And that is, if you live in a human community, there has to be a broadly agreed upon a set of, of moral guidelines for how to live successfully within the community. And Leopold reasoned that there should be a similar set of ethical or moral guidelines for living in the ecological community and living in the ecosystem in living in the biosphere. And he said, the land ethic simply enlarges the boundaries of the community to include soils, waters, plants, and animals, or collectively the land. And Leopold's land ethic, as he described it, the land ethic then reflects the existence of an ecological conscience. And this in turn reflects a conviction of individual responsibility for the health of the land. So there Leopold is bringing it all together. The land ethic as, as a, a code, the ecological conscience, a moral compass in which you, we understand what's right and wrong to do and that we're doing this in order to ensure the health of the land or the health of the environment. So Leopold, of course, wrote prolifically uh, in his final years, including, of course, his book, A Sand County Almanac, that became essentially the, uh, the Bible of the modern environmental movement. And um, his writing still continues to um, inform and inspire the environmental movement. Land, as Leopold said, you know, a land ethic changes the role of Homo sapiens from conqueror of the land community to plain member and citizen of it. It implies respect for his fellow members and also respect for the community as such. We abuse land because we regard it as the commodity belonging to us 
when we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. So you can see why Leopold's ideas were, were so seductive to the modern environmental movement. He, he was able to put in wonderful writing exactly what the modern environmental movement was, was all about. So for Leopold, this idea of harmony with nature um, became essentially by the second half of the 20th century, the dominant philosophy of American conservation. And it seems likely that it will continue to remain dominant in the early years of the 21st century. Now, the crystal ball is kind of fuzzy where we might be going next. I'm sure there will be changes in the future, but for the time being, it's remarkable that Leopold's philosophy that was written now 80 years ago uh, is still the dominant sort of conservation philosophy that we live under. But it recognized human beings as simply being part of, of nature just as any other species. And this idea that we had to live in, in harmony with all the other living creatures um, and the ecosystems that they inhabit. And today, Leopold's philosophy, what, what he would have probably, if the term had been around, he might have used the term, but today we call this ecosystem management, where we're looking out for the health of the ecosystem or the health of the land, as Leopold would have called it. Ecosystem management takes this holistic view. It sort of is this overarching umbrella under which the natural resource fields that are clearly important we have to manage natural resources in a sustainable way. It also overarches the preservationist movement. It is still very important that we preserve remnants of intact nature as uh, places where we can, as Leopold said, observe normality and where many species will make their, their last stands. And of course, it's also important to protect species that are directly threatened by human activities. But ecosystem management embraces all of that. It's the umbrella under which all of that uh, operates. It didn't replace the other philosophies in entirety, but it brought them together in one common purpose. And Leopold, although he died in 1948, a year before his book, A Sand County Almanac, was actually published, he never got to actually see it uh, in, in print. But in a Sand County Almanac, um, Leopold gave us a perfect golden rule. Golden rules are wonderful because they're you know, quick statements that encapsulate what a philosophy is all about. And for Leopold in his essay, A Land Ethic in the Sand County Almanac book said, examine each question in terms of what is ethically and aesthetically right as well as what is economically expedient. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. The golden rule for the uh, modern environmental movement, if you will. <clears throat> so for Leopold, you know, he never got to really see his philosophy um, take hold. It would wait a couple of decades after his death for it to really take hold. But Leopold you know, could see where this was going. And uh, he left some, some parting words that sort of give us both hope and provide, you might say, the, the daunting challenge that we face in living up to his philosophy. So Leopold defined conservation as a state of harmony between men and land. That's a nice, concise definition, but just a couple of sentences after he wrote that sentence in the essay, The Land Ethic in a Sand County Almanac, he says this, we shall never achieve harmony with land any more than we shall achieve justice or liberty for all people. In these higher aspirations, the important thing is not to achieve, but to strive. Leopold recognized clearly that the philosophy of conservation that he was introducing to the world was going to take a long time to take hold. And it was important for conservationists uh, to continue striving to make that philosophy more widely accepted. So it's up to us today to continue uh, 
that striving that Leopold wrote about so long ago. So thank you for listening and I will stop sharing my screen now. And there you all are. Let's see whether there's anything that, oh, a lot of things popped up in, in chat. Let's see. Uh, most of these are seem to be questions about how many people are attending. Okay, well, we can open it up then. Um, people can unmute themselves and ask questions if they would like and be happy to answer. Yes, hi, thank you very much for your program. It was uh, quite excellent. Um, I'm a canoeist and uh, we're thrilled about the active uh, way that dams are being removed from rivers. Our river here, the Des Plaines, mm -hmm. has had almost all of its dams removed. And I'm, I'm curious what your thinking is about that specific action, but also actions like that of, of actually reversing what humans have done. Well, uh, of course, I didn't mention it in the uh, in the presentation tonight, but um, Aldo Leopold was also one of the pioneers in what today we recognize as the field of restoration ecology or ecological restoration. He started that idea um, at the University of Wisconsin Arboretum. And of course, the uh, opening up of, of rivers that had previously been dammed is a, a major accomplishment of, of ecological restoration. Yes. And sure, Leopold, of course, would have been wholeheartedly uh, in favor of this. Um, several of his essays, he, uh, he denounced uh, what dams and other types of, uh, of structures had done to, to rivers. Leopold was a river rat. Remember, he grew up on the Mississippi River in Burlington, Iowa. And throughout his life, he loved uh, traveling on wild, wild rivers and, and did so as often as he could. When he bought his uh, farm uh, on the Wisconsin River in 1935, it was just a couple of years later that the federal government started controlling all the dozens of dams on the Wisconsin River. And um, in doing so, they eliminated the spring floods that were so important to the floodplain forests along the Wisconsin River. And Leopold's property along the Wisconsin River was largely floodplain forest. So he got to see in the final years of his life the, the signs of, of death, really, um, in his floodplain forest. Uh, and Leopold certainly would have been, you know, delighted to see close to close to the to the shack, close to the setting for a Sand County Almanac, that the Baraboo River was one of the first major rivers to have all the dams removed, and of course the Des Plaines River uh, also. But many Midwestern rivers are now running running free in what can only be described essentially as a major accomplishment for ecological restoration. All right. Thank you. Happy to answer any other questions. While we're waiting for you to put your either questions in chat or to unmute, I just want to remind everybody that the recording will be available uh, next week, Monday through Friday. You can sign up. Um, and please encourage your friends to sign up for the recording. Well, I hope if like the students who took my uh, course in conservation biology, you've uh, maybe come to appreciate a little bit more about the complexity and the sort of dynamic nature of the conservation movement in North America. North American conservation was really a, a unique sort of human enterprise. Um, it, it sort of preceded conservation movements around the world. In Europe, uh, conservation of course had um, a very different um, sort of set of ideas, largely because by the time conservation emerged as a philosophy, most of Europe had been almost completely altered. So it was really the almost the unique, the, the unique exper American experience of encountering this vast continent and seeing its wilderness and then seeing it disappear in front of essentially a few generations uh, that really inspired this uniquely American approach to conservation. <laughs>
Hi, Stan. Um, I was fortunate enough to take a Sand Hill Crane tour with you at the Aldo Leopold Foundation. Uh -huh. And um, I really enjoyed the experience. And of course, Aldo Leopold uh, thought Sand Hill Cranes were going to be extinct in the near future. I wonder if you could say things about Sand Hill Cranes and how that experience fits in the kind of things you've been talking about tonight. Well, sandhill cranes are certainly one of the uh, success stories of American conservation, uh, along with a number of other species that we now have in abundance here in the upper Midwest. Uh, it wasn't that long ago, a little over a century ago, that white-tailed deer were essentially absent from the upper Midwest. Uh, sandhill cranes were virtually gone. Wild turkeys were gone. And those three species, of course, are now with us uh, in abundance. And it all is owing to the protectionist approach. It is all owing to, essentially in the case of the Sandhill Crane, uh, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act that for the first time protected migratory birds like Sandhill Cranes and most of our waterfowl species and many of our shorebirds from this horrible over-exploitation that had taken place during the 19th century. So Sandhill Cranes, you know, began their recovery essentially in the aftermath of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And because they reproduced so slowly, it took them a long time to uh, finally really start to reclaim a lot of the uh, range that they had lost in the upper Midwest. But now, fortunately, they are doing extremely well and have essentially reoccupied most of the areas that they formerly occupied in the upper Midwest. And, you know, it was largely the result directly of the protectionist movement, but it was also something more than that. It was also the preservationist approach that preserved wetland habitats. You may remember for a long time in the upper Midwest, we were busy as we could be draining wetlands. And it was only through essentially a change in attitude that started to preserve wetland habitat that the growing population of sandhill cranes had essentially the abundant habitat that they have today to, uh, to expand into. And of course, when we think about, um, you know, the idea of managing sandhill cranes, our sandhill cranes here in the upper Midwest have almost reached the point where we might begin hunting them and treating them again as a, a natural resource, which fortunately we could do today, largely because of Aldo Leopold's thinking uh, that he introduced to the world in game management, that we now know how to exploit species without driving them to extinction. So here, any of your research, have you ever seen anything that indicates that he had any inkling about an air ethic as well as a land ethic? This comes up quite often about, you know, the various aspects of the environment, whether he, whether he would have embraced a, a sea ethic or a water ethic or a land ethic. And I think Leopold thought so holistically about the environment that of course he would have embraced these, these things. And um, remember his golden rule, that golden rule, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. Well, that certainly applies equally well to water, to the oceans, to the atmosphere, the things that we do that indeed destroy or harm the integrity, stability, and, and beauty of the place. So I think although he didn't have anything directly to say about the sea or, or fresh water or, or, or air, uh, he certainly would have embraced those things and probably in his own thinking did. Uh, although at least being a Midwesterner, he was primarily writing for audiences that had the um, American uh, sort of agrarian experience of, of living on the land. The biggest threat to the environment today, well, you know, when we think about the biggest threats to the environment today, I think, you know, we have to imagine that we, human beings, are the biggest threat to the environment because of all the influences that we have, whether it's climate change, whether it's uh, all the other forms of 
of pollution, whether it's the changes in the, the Earth's surface as we alter habitats or destroy habitats, the fact that you know we still haven't universally um, accepted um, the idea of sustainable use of natural resources and that there are still species that are being driven to extinction because we're over exploiting them, often illegally, but we still are, are doing it. So there's no question that if you broke down the biggest threats to the environment today, you could break it down into three components that were introduced by Paul Ehrlich, another you know, famous environmentalist ecologist of the 20th century. He said that you know, the destructive things that human beings do to the environment are essentially the product of three interrelated things that characterize human beings. The first is our density, the number of us that inhabit this planet. But it's more than that. It's also our affluence. It's our consumption of resources. And finally, it's not only how many of us there are and how much of the world's resources we're using, but it's also technology, especially the, the damaging technologies that we use to sustain our modern lifestyle. And Paul Ehrlich pointed out that the, the, the threats to the environment are the product of these three. You can really destroy the environment or harm the environment if there are too many people, or maybe if there are not too many people, if the people are too affluent, if they're using resources excessively, or even if there are not that many people and they're using the resources in a sustainable way, they can still do a lot of harm to the environment through the damaging technologies that they use to sustain their lifestyle. So basically it's, it's us and uh, the, the, th the three things that we have uh, brought down upon the earthly environment. So Leopold's practice of taking copious notes. Oh boy, he was just, um, just amazing. Uh, he was an old fashioned natural historian. Um, and um, for natural history studies, the way you do natural history studies is to go out into nature and observe things or collect things. You write down what you've observed or you bring your specimens back to the natural history museum and then you ponder all the things that you have uh, collected and try to make sense out of it. And that was Leopold's approach to uh, understanding the environment. And one of the things that he did throughout his life actually was to keep notes on phenology. Phenology is the, the study of the timing of seasonal events. And Leopold was absolutely obsessive about noting when the first plants blossom, when the first migratory birds arrived, all of the sort of seasonal events of nature. And he did this and recorded it in his notebooks back in the 1930s and 1940s, especially after he bought the farm that became the setting for the shack. And today we've been able to go back to Leopold's notes and demonstrate how hundreds of species of plants and animals are now shifting the timing of their seasonal events because of climate change. His notes essentially have given us a sort of a, a, of a baseline against which to understand how climate change is affecting the lives of, of plants and animals uh, through the changes in, in climate. Different government agencies uh, swayed um, their views on conservation well, this is an interesting question about how these different philosophies have still existed in their respective silos, if you will. And um, the Forest Service, Aldo Leopold's agency that he worked the first half of his career essentially in, uh, remained largely committed to Gifford Pinchot's philosophy. Uh, until the modern environmental movement hit and they were under pressure to manage the national forests in a different way. And it took a while. It wasn't until the late 1990s that the US Forest Service finally shifted its mission to what today we call ecosystem management, but that was what, it was exactly 
what Leopold was trying to push the US Forest Service to do in 1924 when he left the Forest Service. Uh, when you read his, uh, essentially his, his ex explanation of why he quit the Forest Service, if you read that letter and didn't see the, the date and didn't know the author, you would think it was a disgruntled Forest Service employee of maybe the 70s or 80s complaining about the way the Forest Service was managing the national forest. So things do eventually uh, come around. And of course, Departments of Natural Resources in all 50 states, they're still the Department of Natural Resources. The bulk of their attention is devoted to essentially ensuring the sustainable use of natural, natural resources. Groups, organizations like the EPA, of course, take a, a much broader view, but even the EPA is primarily focused on the human environment rather than the, the ecosystem uh, per se. We still don't have uh, a federal agency that deals essentially with the overall nation's uh, ecosystem health or land health as Leopold would have called it. We still are waiting for that, that to happen. Let's see if we got all those questions. I guess we have. All right, well, um, Terry, when you're ready, you can call the meeting to a close, I guess. All right, I'm gonna stop the recording.